Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at an episode of Answers News, which seems to be mostly a circle jerk of Ken Ham and his little minions telling each other how amazing they all are, with brief interludes into some popular science news articles. It's too long for me to do all at once, so I'm going to start with their segment on malaria. Hi, and welcome to Answers News for May 11th, uh, 2017. So we're here with Bodie and Ken and Georgia. And, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just trying to not, not get this Georgia. to... Ah, there we are. There we are. I've got it up on my iPhone. Yeah, your iPhone, which would not exist if people like you were in charge of what is taught in science classes. Okay. And uh, there we are. We're running on my iPhone there, so people can okay. start commenting and okay. sending emojis. We always like to say something to get started, mm -hmm. so I want to tell you how my day began. Okay. How my day began. Okay, okay, let's hear it. I walked out of the house to get in my car. <laughs> and I had found that the entire flock of Canadian geese that exists <laughs> In the U.S. You say that as if it's surprising to you that wild animals don't obey our arbitrary borders. Here's a map of where Canadian geese can be found. They are called Canadian geese because where they live normally, the dark yellow section, is mostly in Canada. But they do go all over the place when they migrate. I know I'm nitpicking here, but you seemed genuinely flummoxed as to why an animal that we arbitrarily called Canadian wasn't sticking to our arbitrary borders. Had flown over my car during the night <laughs> and dropped little messages. No, they weren't little messages. Moms. They were big <laughs> messages. And nowhere else in the neighborhood. I find that extremely unlikely since Canada geese very rarely poop while flying. They usually drop their loads just before takeoff. Now, it is possible that one or two of them may have dropped a deuce on your car, but you're either exaggerating how bad it was, or it wasn't actually Canada geese, and you just said that so you could get your little dig in about those pesky Canadians sneaking across your borders. Now, I can't say I'm not happy that whatever birds they were singled you out, though. I wouldn't say this about many people, but you deserve it. I'll bet you'll find a way to blame the atheists for it, too. It was only my car. Maybe the atheists that, sent them. That Fuck. You. Okay. All right. So our first article is from Live Science. Italian Island's mutation fights malaria but raises risk of other diseases. So this is actually a really good example of how mutations are, are almost always a trade-off. So Firstly, I would like to say that it was annoying having to search for your articles because you guys forgot to put them in the description. This alone doesn't bother me as it is something I've been known to do myself, but what really does bother me is the fact that your comments are disabled so I have no way of letting you know that you forgot that very important detail. Second, of course mutations often come with the trade-off. They're random, but make enough random changes to the genetic code, something will happen. Please remember what's happening here though, you guys are admitting that through random mutation, information, in this case malaria resistance, was added into the genetic code. You have in the past claimed this to be impossible, but here you are admitting it, but saying it comes with side effects. I don't recall any evolutionary biologist ever claiming that all mutations favored by natural selection were side effect free. But you know what? You also freely admit that information can be removed from the genetic code by way of mutation, so now you have a beneficial mutation with some harmful side effects, making it more likely that nature will select the mutations which at this point keep the beneficial trait and lose the harmful ones, aka natural selection can take it from here. Though from reading the article, it seems like human scientists, dare I say even evolutionists, are using this information to develop treatments for malaria without the nasty side effects and without having to wait for nature to sort it out. So let's just add that to the list of practical uses for the theory of evolution. So while it might help in one way, it's not going to help as much in another way. And so in this example, now this isn't evolution, even though the article starts mm -hmm. off with that once again, um, it's not evolution. No, you're right. Mutating genes that help fight off dangerous infections don't look anything like evolution, which has mutating genes that assist with survival, sometimes by fighting off dangerous infections. 
I'm lost. What was the difference again? And so um, what this really is is that they become more resistant to malaria, which is obviously a good thing. So they have evolved a trait that helps them resist malaria, but it's not evolution? Okay. But then they become more susceptible to multiple sclerosis and lupus, which are autoimmune diseases. Yeah, random mutation with benefits comes with side effects. Doesn't mean it's not evolution. In fact, it's exactly what you would expect if evolution is true. Did you miss the part of the article that said this mutation can actually be found all over the place, but it's much less common than in Sardinia? Reason being, there was a large outbreak of malaria in Sardinia in the 1930s, leading to natural pressures that would select in favor of a gene that helps with resistance to malaria. As far as lupus and MS are concerned, malaria kills more kids than they do, so the selective pressure in favor of the gene outweighed the pressure against the gene. So there you have it, human evolution in action. Now let's all root for those evolutionist scientists who are using this information to fight malaria without making MS and lupus worse. So it's a trade-off. Is that sort of similar to sickle cell anemia? It sure, is. it would yeah. be very similar so to that. So if they have the, the uh, het like heterozygous... Heterozygous, if they just have one copy of the mutation... And they have sickle cell anemia, so they're blood sick, but they're resistant to malaria. They're it is similar to sickle cell anemia in that both provide resistance to malaria and both have some non-malaria related consequences. The article you mentioned doesn't say how the trait is inherited, and I got no impression that it works in the same way as anemia, so I have a strong suspicion here that you just figured out a big word you could use to make yourself look smart, so you threw it in there. They're resistant to malaria and they're not terrible as far as their blood goes. Yeah. It's when it's homozygous, they have two mutations, that's mm -hmm. when it becomes De they, very they detrimental. Have, they have brain problems. Yeah, yeah, they have a lot of problems. But, but here's the uh, thing. If, yeah, the trade -offs if, there too. if evolution mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. by mutations over millions of years... Right. So there's no net gain. As I explained, even if there is no net gain over a person's lifespan, resistance to a disease that kills you when you're a child is more likely to survive and reproduce even if it makes you more susceptible to a disease that will kill you after you're fully grown and have had children already. This is true for both the side effects of sickle cell anemia and the mutation discussed in the article. Both mutations protect children from malaria, and both sets of side effects are much more likely to be fatal when they are older and have had a chance to breed. Now, I know from a humanist perspective, this is not how we want to go about curing diseases, by just curing it long enough for a patient to have had some babies and then screw them. But evolution is not a doctor with compassionate feelings towards people who have already reproduced. Evolution is a cold emotion motionless process which only cares if you succeed in reproducing. All the more reason to continue rooting for these evolutionists who are trying to fix this problem without making the things like MS and lupus worse. I remember when I was um, when I was in university, sickle cell anemia was used as an example of a beneficial mutation. Mm -hmm. yeah, would would you want that? that well. Would you yeah. want sickle cell anemia? Yeah. yeah. A beneficial mutation is not necessarily a mutation that you actually want. It is a mutation that assists with survival until the organism can reproduce. Now let's pose a hypothetical scenario for you. There's a mutation which causes the person with this mutation to be completely invincible. Yes! I am invincible! But only until age 25, at which point they suddenly die. Oh! Would you want this mutation? Probably not, but a percentage of people with this mutation would have kids before they die at 25, and those kids all have the same mutation. Extrapolate this out, and as the mutation spreads, more and more people start having kids before age 25, enabling the mutation to spread further, eventually ending up as part of the human race. Not beneficial from a personal standpoint, but super beneficial from an evolutionary standpoint. All this to say, just because you don't like it, doesn't mean it didn't somehow help with baby making. So, yeah. yeah it's so and that's what we have to remember is mm -hmm. that, you know, even if you're, it's not, you're not going in any certain direction. You're gaining here, you're losing here, so. Yeah, it's you're gaining in the fight against malaria and losing in the fight against MS and lupus. How is that not going anywhere? It's going from one disease to another, which is definitely a direction, but it's also giving us clues about how to fight one disease without leading to the others in the process. 
I mean, this is why cancer is such a problem. The majority of people affected by cancer have already done their life's worth of breeding, so there is very little selection pressure against it. So we have genes that might be resistant to diseases that we don't even know ever existed, but traded that resistance for susceptibility to cancer. That's a direction, even if it does suck to get cancer. The trade off, and right. that's what you need to understand when it comes to mutations. A lot of times they're just very bad, right? So, yeah. I mean, sometimes very you get nearly neutral ones, but uh... your order is a bit mixed up there. The vast majority of mutations are completely neutral, having no effects whatsoever. After neutral comes bad, and then in last place comes beneficial. But natural selection selects against the bad and pushes towards the beneficial ones, but it does have to work with what it's given, so that's why we have a bunch of bad mutations going along with us in every generation. Anyways, that's it for this video. I predict that most of the objections to this in the comments will be arguments from consequences, with people saying, Aha! You admit that evolution can lead to horrible things like cancer, and that evolution doesn't care about people! We'll see. Remember to follow me on Twitter and support me on Patreon. Also, I would like to make my Patreon page a bit better, so if you have any ideas for rewards that you guys would like, leave a comment down below or tweet it at me. Uh, YouTube notifications are a bit weird, so I'm much more likely to get a tweet than a comment, just FYI. Uh, anyways, see you next time!